tonight, a Canadian great gone. Director Norman Jewison has died. And action! From comedy to drama to musicals, an acclaimed career that transcended genre and a lasting impact here at home. An incredibly accessible, giving, uh, always available for a life lesson. What's behind a new limit on foreign students coming to Canada? It's a bit of a mess and uh, it's, it's, it's time to rein it in. And a Canadian doctor's medical mission in Gaza. So you walk into the hospital and what hits you? The chaos, the drones humming around, the bombs dropping and the chaos. Well, he wants the world to know about the patients he left behind. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thanks for joining us. For director Norman Jewison, film was a way of talking to the world, and for decades, that was a wide-ranging conversation, from musicals to thrillers. His work made people laugh and cry and confront some hard realities. Tonight, it and his Canadian pride are being remembered after his death at the age of 97. He never did win an Oscar for Best Director, but when it comes to Hollywood's telling of the political and cultural stories of the times, his imprint was indelible. Jewison's list of accolades and accomplishments is long. Eli Glasner takes us through the highlights and the reaction to the news tonight. Okay, you're excited and action. He was Canada's most acclaimed film director. Norman Jewison worked with many of Hollywood's biggest stars, but he never forgot where he came from. And, and stay with your forklift trucks. He got his start in 1952, directing variety shows for the new CBC TV. But within a decade, he began making the movies that made him famous. Comedies at first, but soon serious dramas on serious issues like racism. I earned that money 10 hours a day, seven days a week. Colored can't earn that kind of money. In the Heat of the Night was set in the racially divided South. It won five Oscars, including Best Picture, and earned Jewison his first Best Director nomination. Then Jewison showed his range, winning acclaim from musicals, The Fiddler on the Roof, and Jesus Christ Superstar. And then a third directing nomination for the romantic comedy, Moonstruck. Okay, I don't care, I don't care. Take me, take me to the bed. Today, it's Oscar winner Cher remembered him, saying, thank you for one of the greatest, happiest, most fun experiences of my life. He went on to found the Canadian Film Centre in the late 1980s to help train homegrown talent. I said, you know, we got to get going. We have to go to work. We have to train young people and we have to, we have to, uh, film is the, is really the literature of this generation. In a statement today, the CFC paid tribute to its founder saying Norman was loved for his creative spirit, his infectious energy, for his commitment to social justice and advancing the art of storytelling. When director Barry Averich first arrived in Toronto, Jewison was one of the first people he turned to. The most un-Hollywood Hollywood person I've ever met. I mean, incredibly accessible, giving, uh, always available for a life lesson. Well, Irving. You're one heavy dude. I'll tell you. And in 1999, when the Oscars finally honored Jewison with the Irving J. Thalberg Award, as usual, he was thinking of the next generation. Just find some good stories. Never mind the gross, the top 10, bottom 10, what's the rating, what's the demographics. Just. Just find some good stories. It's good advice for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you got a chance to meet him, I gather. I mean, the amazing thing about Jewison is like, he is this giant of Canadian film, one of our biggest exports in filmmaking, but in person he was so approachable, so affable. We were at the Hazelton Hotel. They did a renaming of a screening room in his honor. Everyone wants to express their gratitude to him. What did he want? And this was just last September to ensure Canadian films would be on that screen, his screen. Make sure you show Canadian films there. And the Canadian Film Center, which he kind of lit the spark, that, as, on top of his amazing films, that is his legacy. Good for him. What a loss. Thanks, Eli. You're welcome. Canadian colleges and universities are combing through the details tonight after the federal government said it will put a cap 
on international student visas for two years. And as Kate McKenna explains, not every province will be treated the same. Some international students say they moved to Toronto to kickstart their dreams, but it can be a difficult journey. Reducing the number of international students is good. Like uh, after people coming out, students coming to uh, Canada, they, they become become like in a trap. Like they get no job. They have to make more than what they expected. Now Canada's immigration minister is vowing to slash the number of international student permits issued for the next two years, reducing them by a third to about 360,000 undergraduates next year. And he warns some private colleges are swindling students for profit. It is, it is not the intention uh, of this program to have sham commerce degrees or business degrees that are sitting on top of a massage parlor uh, that someone doesn't even go to. Students themselves have been sounding the alarm, saying some people are spending their life savings and getting a subpar education. Majority of students graduating from these institutions uh, are, are never even able to get a job in their field. In the last 10 years, the number of international students in Canada has grown exponentially. By the end of December, there were more than a million. One factor in a housing crisis the government is struggling to address. It's a bit of a mess and uh, it's, it's, it's time to rein it in. Opposition leaders say it's a mess of the Prime Minister's own making. He and Sean Fraser granted the study permits for tens of thousands of students to come and go to fake colleges that the Liberal government now admits are, were quote, puppy mills. He did that. This cap is uh, punishing students for the failure of the government when they knew full well, when Justin Trudeau knew full well, that there was a housing shortage and a housing crisis and he did not act. The announcement also leaves some colleges and universities worried. I'm concerned that our members are being labeled uh, as uh, fly-by-night. Uh, which is not the truth. Our institutions have been operating, many of them for 50, 75. We have members that are over 135 years in operations in Canada and have trained hundreds of thousands of students. So, Kate, the thing is, international students are such a huge part of so many campuses. So how is this cut going to play out? Well, first, international students who are already here won't be affected, and neither will people in elementary or high school or those pursuing master's and doctoral degrees. Each province and territory will be assigned a number of permits based on population. So for places like Ontario, Nova Scotia and British Columbia, that could mean big cuts. The Immigration Department says it won't share those numbers yet. First, it wants to meet with the provinces. But Mark Miller is clear. Hundreds of these private colleges could end up shutting down. Well, thanks for laying that out. Kate McKenna in Ottawa tonight. Now to politics south of the border, where the New Hampshire primary is just hours away. Nikki Haley is all that stands between Donald Trump and the Republican nomination. Paul Hunter is there as both campaigns push to the finish line. So happy pre-election day. Former so South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley, the last Republican standing as challenger to Donald Trump in the battle to be that party's nominee for the White House this fall, underlining the looming choice for voters in New Hampshire. It is now a two-person race. And what that means is, your decision tomorrow is, do we want more of the same or do we want a new generational leader? But by almost any measure, it would be a stunner if Haley were to now upset the former president. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis quit the contest because he said, It's clear to me that a majority of Republican primary voters want to give Donald Trump another chance. DeSantis then endorsed Trump and slammed Haley. This Donald Trump country! Tim Scott, senator from South Carolina, Haley's home state, endorsed Trump last week. And a South Carolina congresswoman has also endorsed Trump. Haley seems unfazed. I have fought the political class all my life. Trump is meanwhile urging his New Hampshire supporters to now get out and vote, reminding them his lead over Haley in the polls here and beyond is commanding. She's down very low. She's down very low, but we'll finish it off. This could, this could end it. Outside a last-minute Haley event in Concord, New Hampshire, some of those who came to see her speak were still undecided, even just a day before the vote. Do you know who you're going to vote for tomorrow? Not yet. <laughs> uh, not yet. I wanted to see. I wanted to see Nikki. 
others, underlining Trump's immense popularity is at once baffling and sobering. What do you think a Trump presidency would mean for this country? I think just, uh, you know, clearly chaos. I mean, he just, you know, I, I, I just can't believe that people are willing to kind of relive the four years that we had with him. So, Paul, if things go as predicted, as expected tomorrow and Trump wins, what then is the best case scenario for Haley moving forward? Well, the best case scenario, if she doesn't win, and indeed nobody expects that she will, is that she exceed expectations, that she get more votes than anybody thinks she'll get. That allows her to say, hey, my support is growing. People are coming to me. She can say to voters in South Carolina, the next state that matters in the primary season, hey, come with me. Maybe then she can grow it from there. But that's a lot of maybes, Adrian, a lot of ifs, a lot of crossed fingers, but it is something to watch for tomorrow. All right, Paul Hunter in Concord, New Hampshire. Now, Tuesday is expected to be another rough one for thousands of commuters in Vancouver. A strike has shut down the city's bus system. Mira Baines now on the impact of the walkout and how long it is expected to last. Commuters were left in the lurch. I didn't know there was a strike beforehand, so I was just waiting at the bus stop and then noticed that all buses were canceled. My friend, come here, try me go to walk. Oh, my God. Bus supervisors walked off the job, shutting down Metro Vancouver bus routes and sea bus routes and leaving 300,000 people looking for a way to get around. Rideshare fares spiked. $26, $30 to Vancouver and back. $60. Some people get that in the day. Marisol V. Giegas relies on sea bus to get to work. Cycling houses and, and I cannot afford that money. So for me, it's very important to take the ride from my sea bus every day. Talks between the union and Coast Mountain Bus Company failed to cement a new collective agreement over the weekend. The big sticking point is really is wages. Uh, we just hope the union uh, will come back as well with the realistic expectations about what a new contract might look like. The union wants wage parity with other transit employees. The Coast Mountain Bus um, are more, seem more interested in assigning blame and to smearing our members than to getting a deal. The province says it wants negotiations to resume. We do have some tools available to us if both parties agree. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, appointing a special mediator and that is a consideration. The union says this is a 48-hour job action, meaning it will end early Wednesday. But before that, it could spread. The union has filed a complaint with the Labour Relations Board arguing it should be allowed to pick it outside rapid transit stations, meaning trains could also be affected. Mira Baines, CBC News, Vancouver. And in Saskatchewan, teachers will be back on the job tomorrow after staging a one-day strike for the second time in a week. So the teachers are demanding smaller class sizes and more supports for students with complex needs. The union says negotiations have reached a stalemate, while the province says it's offered a fair deal. Turning now to a world first tonight in the fight against malaria, Cameroon is now the first country to launch a vaccination campaign against the mosquito-borne disease. Lauren Pelly on the cautious hope that this could save lives. A historic moment in the fight against malaria. Health officials in Cameroon just launched the world's first vaccination campaign against the deadly disease, providing shots to the country's tiniest patients. This vaccine rollout means that a world where children no longer die from a simple mosquito bite is within our reach. The immunization program targets six-month-olds and was years in the making. Millions of children elsewhere in Africa have already gotten doses in a pilot project, which led to dramatic drops in severe infections and a 13% drop in deaths among eligible children. This has been a long road, and so it makes this day perhaps even more significant. Across Africa, malaria typically kills hundreds of thousands of people every year, and most of those deaths are children under the age of five. The vaccine is rolling out at a time when global malaria cases are on the rise. There were nearly 250 million cases in 2022, 5 million more than the year before, and far above pre-pandemic tallies. 
Scientists pin the rise on climate change, as changes in temperature, humidity and rainfall can all influence the survival of malaria-carrying mosquitoes. That makes wiping out malaria a daunting task. The other challenge is hesitancy. This resident of Douala in Cameroon said health officials need to better inform the community as only a handful of people showed up on day one to get a shot. I think it's going to take a lot of support and, uh, and guidance and, and hard work uh, from countries and, and partners to, uh, to ensure that it's successful. A total of 20 African countries plan to introduce immunization programs this year and a second vaccine that's even more effective is on the way as well. The question now is just how many people will get these long-awaited shots. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. Anger, frustration, fear, all of that on display in Israel's parliament when about 20 family members of hostages believed to be held in Gaza stormed a committee hearing. <laughs> Holding up signs and pictures of their loved ones, the group surrounded lawmakers, shouting for them to do more to bring the hostages home. Today in the Knesset, everything just uh, blew up. They betrayed them on October 7th and they are responsible for their life, and they are responsible to bring them back. About 130 hostages are still believed to be held captive in Gaza. Where fierce battles are intensifying between Israel and Hamas in Han Yunus, including Israeli airstrikes. Doctors warn Nasser Hospital is on the brink of collapse as nearby neighborhoods come under attack. After recently returning to Canada from a different Gaza hospital, Dr. Yasser Khan knows that pressure intimately. The smell of blood, uh, the smell of dust, the screams. You hear screams and mass chaos, like just massive chaos. In just a few minutes, we sit down to talk about what it was like to go there and then to leave. The United States and the United Kingdom confirm they've carried out new strikes tonight against Houthi targets in Yemen. Officials say they carried out eight strikes in total. Canada is among several countries playing a supporting role. This is the latest in a series of military strikes that's in response to a slew of attacks by the Iranian-backed Houthis on commercial ships in the Red Sea. The opening of a controversial temple in India is being celebrated by some, but bringing up painful memories for others. This is a party and a government that protects and furthers Hindu interests. Why some worry about what it means for the future of the country, next. Plus, they brought their clock-fixing skills all the way from Ukraine. Finally, people really appreciate their talent. The Newfoundland community no longer frozen in time. And later, a BC woman discovers a taste from the past. Put my nose up to it, it smells delicious, it smells amazing. The wedding cake pulled from the freezer more than five decades later. We're back to two. A remote part of northwestern China has been hit by a 7.1 magnitude earthquake that downed power lines and destroyed at least two homes. State media reported powerful aftershocks and tremors felt as far away as Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. No deaths or injuries have been reported. Millions of Hindus in India are celebrating the opening of a new temple. It is built on contested land that has a painful past for many Muslims. Our South Asia correspondent Slima Shibji was there as it was consecrated by the Prime Minister himself. A raw display of Hindu faith lining the streets of Ayodhya. Thousands of devotees have descended on the holy city. Glory to Lord Ram, they shout, one of Hinduism's most revered deities. But the new temple dedicated to him is steeped in controversy. Built on the ruins of a centuries-old mosque demolished by a Hindu mob in 1992. An illegal act that sparked riots that killed 2,000 people, mostly Muslims. Millions in India believe this was where Ram was born and that there was a temple here first. As India's Prime Minister led the consecration of the temple, he leaned into those emotions. Ram Our Ram has arrived today after waiting for centuries, Narendra Modi said. Missing from the crowd are leaders of India's political opposition, who accuse Modi of manipulating a religious event for a political boost with his Hindu base. 
Modi's promotion of the temple, another sign for many observers of Hindu dominance in a country that has secularism enshrined in its constitution. It kind of sends a very strong message down to the Hindu voter that this is a party and a government that protects and furthers Hindu interests. But for those who've been camping out for days close to the temple, there's already fervor and faith in Modi. He's made our dreams come true with the temple, says Parya Garg. It's about pride in being Hindu. In the shadow of this new temple and the mass celebrations, Ayodhya's Muslim community is quietly resigned to being sidelined in the city they've lived in for generations. Still, there's a sense of unease. The mosque to replace the one destroyed, ordered by India's top court, is stalled. The land allotted, isolated, and far from the city center. I have prepared it after. Khalik Ahmad Khan is a litigator who carefully documented the Muslim deaths in Ayodhya after the mosque was razed. This is the fear. This is the we fear. This may happen, violence may happen after 22nd January. And Muslims are helpless. He says for his community, there's little faith left in India's institutions. With religion and politics deeply intertwined and an election this spring that's likely to further divide the country. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ayodhya, Uttar Pradesh. A piece of history in a small Newfoundland community is ticking away again tonight. They cleaned it, they adjusted, and it's, it's, it's running. The Ukrainians who brought the town's old clock back to life. Plus a Canadian doctor's experience inside a Gaza hospital. Massive chaos of people running around, babies left on the floor because there's no beds. What he saw inside the war zone and why he won't hesitate to go back. And more than three months after the war began, how close is Israel to accomplishing its goals? It's clear that Hamas still has control over many of the tunnels. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. Yeah, that's it. Let's do it. Ooh, look at that. Some subway riders in Toronto got a big surprise this morning. They came face to face with the Stanley Cup and former Leafs defenseman Thomas Caberlet. Oh, it's amazing. What, what a stroke of luck to be on the train at this time. I was very surprised, very surprised and excited. My husband's going to hate me for it today. <laughs> so what's going on? The goal was to build some buzz for next month's NHL All-Star Game at Scotiabank Arena. A historic clock in Newfoundland is running for the first time in 40 years, and that is thanks to two newcomers from Ukraine. The couple has been fixing clocks for half a century. And as Peter Cowan shows us, that broken clock helped give them a new purpose here in Canada. For 120 years, the clock on top of the old post office has been a fixture in Carbonier. It stopped running in the 1980s, and lots of people have tried to fix it. I got it working for about 10 minutes or so, but I couldn't figure out some, some sort of stuff. So I went on YouTube and, and got stuff like that, and I just couldn't decide on, on how to get it going. Ludmila Pass and her husband spent 52 years fixing clocks in Ukraine. They arrived in Newfoundland in November to join their daughter and escape the war. They were worried about what they would do in Canada until they heard about the clock that needed fixing. They took away all the rust. Also, there was a problem because it's uh, very close to the ocean and lots of salt and dirt during many years became like a stones inside of the details. And so they cleaned it, they adjusted and it, it's, it's running, yeah. The town's deputy mayor says the clock's new lease on life has brought some excitement. I couldn't thank Julia and her parents enough for, uh, for what they've done for the town of Carbonaire, and it fell right in around Christmas time, so I guess you might say there's a little bit of a Christmas miracle. Yulia Veratenik says her parents' skills weren't valued in Ukraine, but here people are making sure to say thank you. Finally, people really appreciate their talent, and I'm really happy that in their life they are appreciated so much, so it's like very wonderful feeling. 
She says her parents are getting lots of requests from people with long silent cuckoo clocks or grandfather clocks that no longer run. She says they're happy to help since Canada helped their family. Peter Cowan, CBC News, Carboneer, Newfoundland. Now the National digs deeper into the news shaping our world. Checking the reality of Israel's deadly advance against what it said it wanted to achieve. Experts lay out what the fighting likely can't achieve. But first. The bombs dropping and the chaos. The catastrophe of medical care in Gaza. A Canadian doctor shows us what he saw there on a recent mission of compassion. This is the breakdown. Eye surgeon Dr. Yasser Khan spent a week in Gaza to provide care to victims of war. He met with me to explain how it felt, what he saw, and as you'll see, some of those images are disturbing. Was it harder to go there or harder to come back? It was definitely harder to come back. I never thought I'd be saying this, but it was harder to come back. And I felt guilty because I need to be there uh, helping them. The there, Canadian eye surgeon Dr. Yasser Khan talks of, is this place, the pummeled Han Yunus in Gaza, a city under siege, and within it, Scrubs. Okay. the overwhelmed European hospital. He's treated plenty of war wounds around the world, but Gaza was his first active war zone. He got less than a day's notice that he was on a list to be allowed in. That road to Rafah, there's more trucks, teeming with aid trucks, some frustratingly stuck. And we're just going to stop off. And once at the border, the process took so long, daylight slipped away. It's a UN policy that nobody travels after 5 p.m. because there is there is indiscriminate bombing by the um, Israeli forces. So there is there is there is you know cars being driven, ambulances are sometimes uh, attacked uh, by missiles. So so you never know what's going to get attacked and what's not. And so we drove for about 15, 20 minutes. It was dark. We were the only car on the road. And those 20 minutes were really long. Um, I actually made peace with myself, with my family, uh, with God, asked for forgiveness. So you walk into the hospital, yeah. and what hits you right away? Uh, um, the chaos. The drones humming around, the bombs dropping, and the chaos. <laughs> it was this mass chaos. On the floor, they're often sleeping on mats or, or carpets or sheets or on the floor directly, and that's all around. When you enter the hospital, every hallway of the hospital is lined with these shelters. When and where he could, he shot video, took stills, tried to chronicle the reality of what felt so unreal. One of the few functioning hospitals he soon learned. Thousands taking shelter there, desperate for safety, dignity, too much to hope for. He has 20,000 people all, all living in and out, one bathroom for about 200 people. Riots break out over bathroom use. As in, like, spending too much time there? Or? Exactly. And people are unwell, so people they People are unwell. So that's the other thing, is that everybody's coughing. Everybody had that, that Gaza cough, uh, respiratory disease. There's gastrointestinal illnesses. People are sleeping outside. So there's disease everywhere, but there's shortage of antibiotics. Um, Painkiller. They put up with the pain. They will put up because there's no other choice. So they're on the floor because there's no beds. And they're just lying there uh, getting infected, right? Mm -hmm. Because wounds get infected and that's an, it's not a clean scenario. Infection mm -hmm. rates are high and they're in pain, but you got to live with it. What do you wish you'd brought with you? I wish I'd brought more instruments because their instruments are old and they've been overused the last three months. And um, small things, there's no chocolate. Um, and not candies for the kids. And there's so many children, Adrian, just running around and there's no coffee left. So they're always asking uh, foreigners, do you have any coffee, do you have any coffee? From these impressions, you might get the sense that Dr. Khan was in Gaza for weeks, maybe a month. But it was barely eight days. Time moves differently when you're afraid and overwhelmed. And shattered eyes and faces more than overwhelmed. One thing that really struck out to me was what I call now the shrapnel face. When there's an explosion, you know, you don't go like this because you don't know what's happening. And so the shrapnel, whether it's steel and concrete and wood and dust, just comes and attacks your face. This is the classic Gaza face that I saw. I saw so much of this. Who's this uh, little guy? He's, uh, he must have been about an 11-year-old boy. 
who, again, it is a classic shrapnel uh, face. These are all shrapnel kind of injuries on, on all these red dots. Sometimes it's both sides. Behind each angry-looking red mark, debris driven into the skin that has to be removed. And in the case of tiny six-year-old Asil... Her father, I think, was gone. He had to take out her eye. He performed dozens of surgeries like that, often on children in Gaza. In Asil's case, the blast was so severe, something terrible hit her just under her eyebrow. It was this. This rock was embedded in her eye. He can't stop thinking about what happens now for her for all of them. Shrapnel. Burned her hair, too. Exactly. Burned her hair, and she was all covered with dust. I don't know if you can tell, maybe you can't, but all dust, like, you know, mm -hmm. because she was pulled from the rubble. How much pain relief is there for her at this point? There's no pain relief for her, to be honest. I don't know how to take it. Any medical issues? The thing about being a helper, any black curtain coming even as someone now back working with patients in Canada, is that he's still invested in those he left behind. When you hear of the terrible toll in Gaza, you hear the numbers of dead. But there are tens of thousands of profoundly wounded people whose lives would be rough in the best of circumstances. So imagine them in Gaza. All those faces swirl in Dr. Khan's head. All five of your senses are activated and um, are in hyperdrive. The smell of blood, uh, the smell of dust, the screams. You hear screams and mass chaos, like just massive chaos. If people are running around, babies left on the floor because there's no beds. Uh, one baby got forgotten for, for two hours and the baby had a, ma a subdural hematoma and massive head trauma. What happened to the baby on the floor? They finally discover the baby. The mom's not there because she's up in the OR. He was taken to uh, the neurosurgical ward. Thank God neurosurgery made space for the baby because they were full. And we had to leave. I don't know what happened to the baby. Uh, the mother also, they operated on her. They were able to, they amputated one leg. And um, then she was in ICU, but we had to leave. Had to leave as in had to leave Gaza. The window to get out was closing. The job, as he saw it, far from done but the risk was getting stuck. And getting out was as unnerving as getting in. Add exhaustion to the fear, and it's a lot. And he wants to share what he saw out of another fear that people will forget. I had a feeling, uh, a sense of feeling when I was there, Adrian, that these are a people that humanity has really abandoned. Mm -hmm. When you've seen the suffering that I did, you know what, everything else is a blessing. And I came back almost numb. You'll yeah. be back? In a heartbeat, I'd go back to help. Yeah. Dr. Khan, thank you. Thank you so really much. really appreciate that. Thank you. And Dr. Khan tells us the European Gaza Hospital remains open and sort of functioning, at least for now, but the larger Nasser Hospital has been under siege and patients can no longer be moved from one to the other because of the significant IDF presence. Now coming up, as the war rages on in Gaza, there is growing skepticism about whether Israel can achieve its military objectives. The only way to release the hostages is through negotiations. Chris Brown breaks down where the war stands and where it could go next. Israel's war path may not lead to victory. The declared goal by Israel cannot be attained. Hidden behind the death tolls, there are hard truths about the limits of combat. Now the Israelis do not want to go into the tunnels. And what Hamas might consider a win of its own may be within its reach. Chris Brown is here to break down what Israel hopes to achieve and the obstacles in its way. A warning, some images may be difficult to take in. The human cost of the Israel-Hamas war is catastrophic. On average, 250 Palestinians in Gaza are killed every day, half of them children, more than 25,000 in total and counting. Almost 2 million people have been driven from their homes with starvation stalking many of the survivors. Israel's government has ruled out a ceasefire 
saying it's pursuing the war to attain three objectives. חיסול החמאס, השבת כל חטופינו, והבטחה שעזה לעולם לא תהווה עוד איום על ישראל. The first goal, the elimination of Hamas, began with a declaration of war the day after the horrific slaughter in Israel of approximately 1,200 people on October 7th. Twenty days later, following an intensive air bombardment, four Israeli divisions, drawing on more than 300,000 reservists, crossed into Gaza, attempting to take control of the north and Gaza City. Israel claims it has killed up to 9,000 Hamas operatives and fighters. Many of them. Aaron Bregman is a war studies professor in London and a former Israeli artillery officer who took part in Israel's 1982 invasion of Lebanon. The Israelis are moving in the Gaza Strip like a, a herd of elephants, moving forward very slowly with a lot of power with one of the objectives being to protect themselves and not to suffer too many casualties. So militarily... Noor Arafay is a Palestinian scholar from occupied East Jerusalem. I think that Hamas um, has uh, suffered losses, no doubt, but it remains an effective military power on the ground. Even when commanders of certain units actually were killed, these units were able to continue fighting under their deputies. Underground, where Israel's military estimates at least 500 kilometers of tunnels are used by Hamas to hide fighters and to manufacture rockets, much of the labyrinth appears to still be functioning, despite the horrendous bombardment above. It's clear that Hamas still has control over many of the tunnels and can still surprise Israeli soldiers. Now, the Israelis do not want to go into the tunnels, because if they do, go into the tunnels to fight Hamas, they lose all their advantages. They do not have air support, they do not have tank support. It is very likely when this war is over, we will have two things in place remaining in the Gaza Strip. Number one, Hamas. Number two, the tunnel system. Freeing all of the hostages still held by Hamas remains another unfulfilled Israeli war goal. התהליך יושג רק כתוצאה מלחץ צבאי. אם נעצור את הלחץ הצבאי, אנחנו נחרוץ את גורלם להישאר בעזה, כי לחמאס לא תהיה שום מוטיבציה לדון או לדבר איתנו. הם מדברים איתנו רק כשהם רוצים משהו. המשהו הזה, היום, זה שקט. ברגע שאתה נותן להם שקט, מבלי לגבות על זה מחיר, הם לא ידברו איתך. So far, just one hostage, Private Ori Megadish, has been rescued by Israel's military. 105 were released during the November ceasefire with Hamas. At least three were killed by Israeli troops by mistake. Israel estimates 27 others have died in captivity. Hamas claims some of those were killed by Israeli airstrikes. The only way to release the hostages is through negotiations. You, can do, you cannot do it by the use of force. The government tries to convince the people of Israel of that the military operation helps to secure the release of the hostages. This is nonsense. Israel states its third goal is to ensure the militant group does not threaten Israel again. I think that Israel is trying to find any symbolic victory. And uh, they think that killing leaders of big leaders of Hamas would give them some semblance of victory. Most of Hamas's key leaders appear to still be alive, including Yahya Sinwar, the October 7th mastermind. I assume that he is sitting there in his tunnel, just waiting for the war to end, for him to survive, even with less troops with less mortars, with less missiles, with no officers, with no computers, is a sort of victory. Israel's government refuses to spell out its vision for a post-war arrangement, so that, as Netanyahu puts it, Gaza will never be a threat again. 
But Nur Arafay says that cannot be accomplished through war. The declared goal by Israel, which is to defeat Hamas, cannot be attained because Hamas is not simply a military organization. It's a political force and it's an ideology. Despite Israel's failure to attain its key war objectives, public opinion surveys suggest within Israel, most people still support continuing combat operations. But increasingly, any kind of potential Israeli victory is looking further and further away from what its leaders have promised. So Chris, it's interesting. Uh, you noted that public support within Israel for continuing with the war is strong, but at the same time, we're continuing to see more instances of dissent. It's true, Adrian. Uh, within Israel, though, that dissent isn't necessarily driven by the, the terrible humanitarian situation in Gaza, but rather the inability of the Israeli government to free those remaining hostages. We've seen families of those still held by Hamas become more and more desperate. Today, several dozen of them stormed the Knesset or parliament, and they also picketed Benjamin Netanyahu's home. As well, a key member of Israel's war cabinet has also said those war goals cannot be met, echoing what we heard in some of our interviews, because destroying Hamas and negotiating with Hamas to get the hostages out are at odds with each other. And yet, if we pull back outside of, of Israel, though, it, it does seem that the pressure for a ceasefire is really growing. It appears to be. The uh, European Union had a summit today, and it did appear to be very tense between the Israeli representative and the head of the European Union foreign policy wing, who accused the Israelis of not wanting to participate. Joseph Borrell said afterwards that killing Hamas the way Israel is trying to do will not work. And he said, in doing so, Israel is sealing the hate for generations. All right, Adrian. Chris Brown in London. Thanks, Chris. Coming up, let's do what we can to lift your spirits and maybe pique your curiosity. And it smells good. Mm -hmm. So there's the 55-year-old fruit cake. That's right, a wedding cake rediscovered after being forgotten for decades. That's next in our moment. It's interesting. That is a layer of wedding fruit cake rediscovered 55 years after a BC couple tied the knot. It was tucked away in the back of their freezer. And now, believe it or not, it seems to have stood the test of time, just like the long marriage of Rochelle and Brian Marr did. This cake discovery is our moment. It looks good. And it looks great, and it smells good. Mm-hmm. So there's the 55-year-old fruit cake. Do you want to tell the story, Mom? <laughs> no, you tell it. So on her wedding day with Brian, Dad, her friend, Gloria. Gloria, her mother, made this cake. Mary Colatello made this portion to be opened 2018 for our 50th anniversary. But right. of course, it got locked in the deep freeze. Well, lost in the deep freeze. <laughs> So 50 years later, 55 years. 55 years later, dad passed away in June. So mom's found she was supposed to open it with him and eat it. Yeah, five years ago. <laughs> Put my nose up to it and it smells delicious. It smells amazing. But I asked her what we're going to do with it. And she said she's going to give chunks to us. And I was kind of like, oh, I said we should have a feast. Oh, you know, everyone here wants to know what the brand of the freezer is that kept working for, for 55 years. Apparently, it was wrapped up so meticulously, they really think it's okay to eat. I, I'm braver people than me. For all of us here at The National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.